of, of um, Gila and um, we'll go from there. So uh, the title of this presentation is My Practice in Mosaic Portraiture. And our featured speaker, Gila Rayberg, is um, from Gila Mosaic Studio. She's an internationally known uh, mosaic artist and has won numerous awards, um, especially for her expressive and whimsical portraits. Um, she'll also present a behind the scenes case study of the portrait she did of John Mosul, um, master of horse that resides at um, the ruins in Western Pennsylvania. So um, Gila, I'm gonna turn this over to you. You should be able to um, show your slides, share your slides. Okay, can you all hear me? All right, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. I'm just gonna say one thing also, uh, housekeeping things, as I give my slide presentation, most of my slides have a number on them on the top right. So if you do have a question that you wanna ask about a particular slide as it goes by um, and you don't wanna remember the name or something, you can jot down the number real quick so you, you can, uh, could be helpful to you. So I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to flip my screen to the right direction and away we go. All right. So I was born into this family right here. I am the youngest of six kids. You will see five of them here as I'm the youngest. My mom was pregnant with me when this photo was taken. <laughs> These are my five older siblings and all of them were into music and art when I was born. And so I was very lucky to um, grow up in a Michigan public schools where we had a very good music program. And that is what really kind of propelled me through early life. Um, I participated in every musical endeavor that I could. Um, played recorder and I remember begging my grandfather to buy me a wooden recorder when I was very young before I could start cello in school and cello was my first instrument and I really loved it and uh, then I switched to trombone and you see in the bottom picture there trombone um, me playing trombone with my brother and my sister and my niece and we always had strange ensembles of music in my family as I was growing up. And the four, the four of us are ones in our family that all became professional musicians. Um, and I ended up getting my bachelor and master's degree in music and was a freelance musician for many years. I traveled and I taught music. Um, somewhere along the line while I was in undergraduate school, I visited one of my older sisters, who is also a, uh, a mosaic artist. Some of you might have come across her, Elizabeth Raby. And I stayed some time with her while I was in, uh, I, think, I think I was a junior in undergraduate school. And I took a couple of courses at San Francisco State one summer. And uh, I took my one and only drawing and painting course that summer. And I was, oh, was horrible at watercolors. It just gave me fits. I was total water media phobe. And um, my sister was teaching a mosaic class. She had just started doing mosaics. And I did my first mosaic there. And it kind of stuck in my mind. And I didn't really take the course, but I was around when she did it. And I, and I kind of dabbled in it. And then I went on and finished my music degree. And I kind of didn't think about it except for that it kind of was in my mind all the time as I was traveling around and teaching and playing. And so uh, this uh, upper left was me when I was in Malaysia and I taught brass and I ended up uh, directing a brass band in, uh, in Malaysia for uh, youth. And then I taught at the university in East Malaysia 
uh, and was the director of the orchestra there. And then I came back to the United States and I landed in New Orleans. And this was some of the bands that I played with there. And the last band that I played with is the one that I'm in the bottom with. And when I was in New Orleans is when I started doing mosaic again. After 20 years, after I hadn't touched mosaic, it was in my mind all those years doing music, I met my partner and he was a timpanist, percussionist, and I decided to make a table for him. And so all in uh, secret, I got all the materials together and I got this design of a 15th century um, jester timpanist and I built him this table and I had forgotten all of the basic stuff of like what adhesive and prepping or anything. And I made him this round on the left was the original table and it completely fell apart. The whole thing lifted off the base and it fell apart. But he was speechless when I first gave it to him and which he never really actually is. So um, he couldn't believe that I actually did this because I was like, I'm a trombone player. I don't make mosaics. So he was flabbergasted and he was very supportive of me to do mosaics after that. So I started doing them in my kitchen in New Orleans and um, he wouldn't let me throw it away. I was going to just throw it away because it was off the face. But a couple of years. Well, I see my name here, but I don't see my face and I see everybody else's face. Yeah, you only want to watch it more there. You don't want to watch it somebody else's faces. Hello. <laughs> but I don't have any Anyways. audio. Uh, what are the speakers? I don't know where where are the speakers. Do you see speakers? Yeah, right there, honey. All right, Amy, if you can find <laughs> her on the that speaker. Hello. Can <laughs> this is mute. We can mute her. Oh, there we go. Can we mute her? Okay. So we back on track here. Can you so, hear the speaker? What do you mean the speaker? Right there. Are we back on track? Okay, so finally I, I fixed it and I made a new uh, base around it and I've been doing mosaics ever since. So when I first started doing mosaics part-time when I was still a full-time, um, I was still working in New Orleans full-time as a, a musician freelance. Um, I, uh, I got it kind of off track there. Um, my, my having lived in Asia a lot, uh, came up a lot in my, you know, the imagery that I did in my mosaics. I just kind of, whatever kind of inspired me, I showed up in my mosaics and these were the first three portraits that I ever made. Um, the, the one on the left was, uh, just out of my imagination. It's called Ivan and it was after Hurricane Ivan, which hit the Gulf Coast um, where I live now in Florida, um, where a friend of mine had, was living. And then the other two were from photographs, which you see on the right hand side there of, that I took while it was in uh, the top one in Kashmir and the bottom one in a little small island in Indonesia. And so they were very, very early portraits of mine in vitreous glass from photographs. And then Hurricane Katrina was the following year and we evacuated. And during that evacuation is when I decided that I was not gonna play music anymore and that I was going to devote my time to mosaic full time. And that was in 2015. And I decided to um, do mosaic full time. So while I was evacuated and we evacuated to Florida to Perdido Key, which is about three hours um, east of New Orleans, right on the Alabama Florida border, which is where I live now. This portrait, which is of Ray J, who is the keyboard player in that uh, last band I played with in New Orleans, um, was the mosaic that was on the table in my studio that I was working on. And this piano player went missing. We couldn't find him. Nobody knew where he was. And it was freaking me out because I realized that his portrait was, I had just started his portrait and it was on my table in New Orleans. And um, 
anyway, he, he finally showed up and I had been on those sites day after day online, um, searching for him and no one knew that he had a son, you know, in, out of town that he had gone to stay with. Um, so anyway, when I went back to New Orleans, finally, two months later, I finished the portrait and I did this watery background. It's uh, Katrina, kind of homage to Katrina. So that's what that is. The numbers I was talking about are getting hidden because the screen is smaller than the one I was actually preparing the notes on. So sorry about that. So at this early time in my uh, mosaic, doing mosaics, I started um, organizing my photos and sharing them on Flickr. And I started to come across these portraits of this woman that were really cool. And they were very interesting. And every day she would post a, a self portrait of herself. And I just thought, wow, oops, how cool is that? And we started communicating. And she also saw it was about that time that I did my very first um, mosaic self portrait. And she commented on it. And I started commenting on her portraits and her name was Julia Kay and she was from San Francisco and I came to find out that she was doing a self-portrait project and she did it for three years that she did self-portrait and every day she did a self-portrait of herself of obviously because it's a self-portrait so after doing it for three years she decided she still wanted to do portraits but of different people so she invited me to join her party which is Julia Kay's portrait party and to draw portraits of other people so I started by drawing her and doing her portrait so this is Julia Kay and I drew her portrait and I did a little five by five mosaic of her it's called Julia out of the blue and it's in vitreous glass um, and stained glass in the background. And that's a very simple palette, monochromatic grays, black and the red you see is red vitreous, uh, vitreous glass for her lips. And then the red in the glasses is just uh, tinted with some uh, pigment. Just the grout is tinted to get the red. So it was very simple. And this took me about a week to do. And by the time I uh, posted this into the group um, that she had started to invite, and most of the people in the group were drawers, draw, drew and painted. And so there were already hundreds of uh, submissions in the group. And so I was like, I want to do that. I want to be able to do more things that are fast. And so that's when I started drawing and painting more. And so I wanted to uh, learn more traditional medium because up till then I was doing mosaic a lot but I wasn't really drawing or painting so then I started daily drawing and so I started just like anyone would I was doing all kind of exercises so I these I would go through the whole list of all the members and I would just start doing exercises so this is a bunch of one minute drawings I did so I would go through a, um at some point there were like 200 members and so through a few days time I would go through and do like everybody is drawing I would do one minute of each person and then you know I would decide I'm going to spend 20 minutes I'm going to do 20 minutes so 20 portraits or I do you know two minute drawings and I do 10 people you know so I would just every day do a little bit and then I would do some other exercises so I did non-dominant hand drawings and then some continuous line drawing. So these exercises then became my mosaics and I started you know, making mosaics for my drawings. And here's one that I did just from a, one of these continuous line drawings became this uh, little mosaic. I think it was something like a three by five piece and it's in stained glass. This one on the right is a fused glass piece, which was also, I, at the time I had a little um, fused glass kiln in my studio and it was, you know, I was stacking the glass, cutting it and I fused glass, fused the face and I, I did a few of these at the time. And then later this piece became a mosaic and it was called The Painter. And The Painter was based on a, a painting of 
Maureen, who was another woman in the portrait party, who had done this painting on the right, the upper right of child in a chair was Maureen's painting, that, which is what she's painting in my mosaic. But this entire painting, the painter that I did in a mosaic is based on this old Renaissance painting of um, Sophonisha Angosola, I don't really know how to pronounce it, which is um, her self-portrait. So each of these pieces of art is based on the piece that came before it. So um, that's how this drawing became, this used glass piece became this mosaic. And so it goes. And so all these, these are some more of my uh, reaching out to do more, to learn more and more uh, traditional mediums and uh, trying out more um, different media markers, acrylics and colored pencils here. And finally, watercolors. I ended up loving watercolors. That one drawing and painting class I did in college that I hated and I was so scared of water. I finally learned how to deal with water and I now love water. And I, I especially love to do pen and ink drawings. And then some limited palette things. So here's a drawing I did on the woman with the hands. And then here's, uh, I did an acrylic painting on wood and then I turned it into a sculpture. The man on the moon in the bottom is actually a mosaic, which became a sculpture. I didn't want to do the mosaic on the wood because I really liked the painting on the wood. So I wanted to keep it. So I did the mosaic on mesh over the wood. And so I have, I still have the uh, painting, but the mosaic here was done on mesh and then I built the structural form for the moon and I did and I put the mesh onto the form so it's actually a sculpture it's a 3d piece and then the other here's another uh, small black and white painting that I did um girl with the polka dot scarf that I did completely out of stone with the hammer and hardy. So this was a continuation of my development in mosaic based on my drawings where I'm still learning more materials. And now I'm doing stonework with hammer and hardy. So all this while I'm continuing to develop my drawing and painting as well as my mosaic um, technique and materials that I'm using. And here I'm starting to mix more materials together. And again, I did a drawing here, uh, a painting here up on the top left of um, Olivia. Again, she's a member of the portrait party. So many of my portraits came out of the portrait party. Um, her painting in acrylic and then I did a, a little collage, which was pencil, uh, paper collage and paint. And then the mosaic was done on that piece of wood and I just covered the eye, the original acrylic, you can see through the bottom of a crystal glass that I used over the eye. So you get the, that deflection uh, through the magnifying glass. You get that, that look of the light being refracted. Here's another one, just in stained glass. And this is where um, I, you know, I'm, I'm using my uh, monochromatic drawing and to and then and then translating that monochromatic drawing into a co very colorful stained glass piece by concentrating on the tones from the monochromatic drawing and translating them into color, which is something I'm teaching now a lot with my courses that I'm doing live and doing Smalti and Picassiette together. And we concentrate on tone and value rather than um, the color in order to use all of those um, different uh, designs and textures together. Speaking of Picassiette, here's Anna. This is my uh, kitchen goddess number one. And it was my very first fully Picassiette piece that I did. 
and um, this was, I can't remember, I can't remember what year it was. I'm, I think it was in 2012. Anyway, um, I did this painting um, on acrylic in, I really liked this rosy uh, cheek. And then I, I saw in my stash of, of um, plates, which I really hadn't used a whole lot, this one piece of uh, Franciscan pottery of my grandmother's, the little pink, the light pink rose that's in her cheek with the little piece of yellow on it. And I just thought that would make the perfect cheek. And that's where this entire piece started. And I just loved it so much. And I just thought, aha, this is something really, really great. And I just went from there. And this is where all the Picassiette kind of blossomed out of this one piece. And then here's a couple more Picassiette pieces that followed again from my drawings, paintings of um, Julia K people. And here's a couple more of them. The one on the left has just become published in a Brazilian grade school book, which I find very fun because it's such a humorous, fun piece that they wrote to me and asked to use that piece, I think is wonderful. Here's another one. And this is where I really am mixing up a whole lot of different materials together. You can see from my original painting uh, in the back of the photograph on the left, in the back is my original painting. She had glasses on. And when I did the mosaic, I decided to discard her glasses. And I used all different Mexican smalty in her face, including a, um, Chinese smalty, which had these great purples and uh, these uh, greens, which have this edge that's kind of curved on the side. And then um, I used vitreous glass and picassiette and this wonderful uh, Mexican um, flowers from one of those big uh, Katrina ceramic pieces. And then a very delicate china for her hand. And it's just a whole lot of different materials mixed together here. It's a lot of fun to make. I love this piece. And um, so all of these people were, are, were from the portrait party. So um, um, in 2017, the portrait, um, portrait Revolution came out, which is a book that was printed in the UK and the US um, of portraits of the portrait party. And um, I think there's 200 portraits in it. And it's very inspirational. It's, it's divided up into um, different sections by style. And it's really interesting to see different portraits by the different artists in the party, um, um, seeing various um, renditions of like one reference by several different artists. So you see very various different um, stylings of one different reference. And it's a very inspirational book and I'm very um, proud of it. And I'm very happy to be one of the, um, one of the 15 featured artists in it. I can't remember how many. Anyway, it's a lovely book and it's still available um, at bookstores and online. Um, so when this book came out, I did an entire drawing series of it. When our members were getting their books, I asked them all to post photos. Everyone was excited and everyone was posting photos of themselves with their books. So as people got their books, I was drawing portraits of people with their portrait books. So I really love drawing portraits of people, of portraits within portraits anyway, and hands. If you've been watching my uh, work at all, you know that I've been doing hands more and more too. So um, I did a whole series. I think there's 90 portraits in this series of, of, of people in the portrait party holding their books to their page or just the book itself. So this is just a small sampling of them. And also um, some of the people in the portrait party in various parts of the world, because it's an international group, have had uh, shows and meetups in different parts of the world. So the the piece in the upper uh, left of the screen is Julia Kay at a five-year party 
that uh, from a portrait uh, from a photograph I took of her with her pieces at that. And this is one of the most recent pieces I did of her last, you know, during this COVID thing of the Zoom and everything, we had a online meeting of portrait party people where we drew each other. And I did this quick sketch of Julia um, during a Zoom meeting. And then I later did this mosaic from it called Julie with Corona hair. And it was accepted for the Pensacola Museum of Art member show last year and it won the jurors award and I really really love it I have it here hanging in my studio and um I just love it and um I just found out two days ago that one of my favorite pieces that I did last year just got into that same show which will be going up next month so I'm very happy about that so on to oh we're almost to the horse so next up is heads up which is a piece I did not long after I came back from Sardinia, I was um, very honored to be invited by Julie Manassi to participate in the um, Contemporary Mosaic Art Symposium in Sardinia and create a wonderful work for, uh, for that. And then after that symposium, uh, during which I, I just, it was an extraordinary experience and that's a whole nother um, talk. Um, I worked you know, with a wonderful group of people and it was an amazing experience and I worked totally with Hammer and Hardy the entire time. Um, and then after that, I was very fortunate to be able to take a course, a short course, four day course at the Spillenbergo School, uh, Mosaic School. Um, they just happened to have a short course happening there the week that I was going to be there, and I took it, and I learned in a very short time because I had to take the course they were given, but I, I did that very quickly, and I um, was able to get the, the teacher to give me a very short um, lesson on how they do their wonderful uh, technique of portraiture at the school of uh, school in Spilimbergo. And so I have been kind of developing that technique based on that little bit that I learned. And I created this piece after that. Um, and I'm teaching, I'm teaching that now. It's based on basically what I learned in Spilimbergo and what kind of I developed on my own afterwards. And this is the result of that. And uh, I wrote a blog post about a little bit more about that, which you can see more of the technique. And it's, uh, I did the horse portrait a little bit uh, like this also. I didn't, I didn't show the, uh, I didn't have a good video of the flipping part um, of the horse or I would have shown it. But if you go to my website, you can see a little bit of that for this one. Anyway. It's with Smalty, Picassiette, and Slate. Okay, so here we are at the Master of Horse. So you all know about the Ruins Project in um, Western Pennsylvania. Rachel Sager has it, and she, it's an international, <laughs> Um, mosaic art collaboration that she is running and um, installation celebrating coal mining history. And she asked me to create a portrait of John Maskell, who was the master of horse. He was head of, you know, in charge of the horses for the coal mines. And she sent me this photo on the left, which was the only photo that we could find of John Maskell. And it, you, as you can see, it's, it's black and white, it's very tiny. His face is very, very tiny. And so I blew it up and I did some drawings of him. So I drew him and it, I decided, um, you know, I had to decide what to do with him, how big to make him. I wanted to put horse a horse in there. And, you know, it was just kind of the whole thing. She left it up to me what to do. So I started drawing um, some photo, some sketches. And this is what I came up with. I decided to draw, uh, to do him with two horses flanking his sides. 
So I came up with a quick uh, cartoon of him and I began working on his eyes. I decided to use um, Smalty with these rich uh, blues and greens. And this was the, the result. It's mostly Mexican Smalty. There's a little bit of Italian and a little tiny bit of, of, of Chinese where there's these uh, purples. And uh, I just love this Mexican Smalty, these deep, deep purples here. They're just lovely. And these, I love these light greens, like lime greens. Then I did the miner's hat. In the photo, he had like a cap on, but I thought it would be nice if he had a miner's hat that kind of was, looked like a light. Again, I used a crisp, the bottom of a crystal, and then I brought in my Pika Siet, uh, used some of the bottom rims to give it kind of more of a hefty feel. Um, and then also once he had the hat on, the shadow that I gave him in his face kind of makes more sense once you see him with the hat on it. Then I went to do the shirt, and this is where I have one of those aha Pika Siet moments, where it is, um, where I find this bowl, you know, one of these bowls that had all kinds of different um, things on it, and there was a horse on here, and I thought, ah, oh, that would be really lovely. It had a gold rim around it, so I cut it out real nice, and I gave him a nice gold, like, bolo button on his shirt and uh, this the shirt was made out of marble and then uh, unglazed porcelain for the sweater part. I wish now that I had been at the ruins and I saw how jaggedy everything is kind of that I hadn't kind of straightened it out and then I after I was there I sent Rachel some of this material some of the green and the purple so that she could jagged it jaggedize it <laughs> because it's a bit too straight. So then I, after I did the body part, I did again, simple cartoons of the horses. And again, I started with the eyes and I decided to do the horses in marble. And I had these really nice, um, like taxidermy eyes. And I don't really remember where I got them, but they look, worked great. This one, the one on the right, just looks at you all the time. No matter where you are, he looks at you. I thought it would be really nice to have some metal in the bridle. And so I asked Rachel if she had anything and she sent me these uh, some metal that she had uh, salvaged and excavated on the site at the ruins. And I was able to use three of the pieces that she sent me and I needed four really for the design. And so I made a fa um, piece, uh, the one on the right on the bottom um, is actually Mexican smalty, that kind of metallic uh, Mexican smalty that you can get is the one on the right is kind of a fall kind of one that I made. And so then the horses, that's the finished horses. And then, um, then I had to carefully put the pieces um, together, make sure that they all fit. This thing moves. I thought this was a little video. Oh, I guess it's not working. Okay. Oh, all right, never mind that. I thought that was supposed to be a little video, but it didn't seem to work. Okay, so this is all the pieces of the, um, all the pieces finished. And then in order to ship it, I was supposed to go to the ruins to install it myself, but then because of COVID, I couldn't go. And so I had to ship it there. And then Rachel was gonna um, 
install it. So in order to, to ship it for installation, I had to put it together and, and put the tape marks on so that she'd know which pieces went together where. So I had to carefully put it together and tape it. So um, tape the pieces and then I had to stack it with foam in between each piece that's that it is and then I shipped it off to Rachel and she installed it finally this past September I made it to the ruins and I'll tell you what it was so magical it was just every bit as wonderful and better than I thought it was going to be I just had the time of my life um, the tour was amazing. The whole site was amazing. And I can't wait to go back again and see what else has been installed since. Um, so this was uh, what I saw when I got there. This was the room. Uh, this is now called the portrait room. She had some other names that she was going to call it before, but then she decided now on the portrait room. And uh, here's a little bit, a bigger, wider view of it. You can see she went back there to, to, to show me with the light that you could see I had put gold in the main so that you could see it. It's very dark in that room where it is now. And it's a little hard to see in this photo, but the floor was completely, had a big mound in it. It's very, very uneven. She was about to, um, they were about to um, dig out the floor and, and even it out right after I left there. But you can see that the walls are all empty. When I got there, that portrait of uh, the master of horse was the only thing in that room. And uh, she wanted me to let you know that there are several portraits being done. When you, if you follow Rachel, you know there's some other portraits being done right now um, that are going to be going up in this room this year, which is very exciting. And while I was there, I was there for two days and I worked together side by side with Rachel. And we, what we did, what she's calling intuitive marginalia, which was awesome, which was while I was there, just intuitively, I put down the stuff that's on the left side there. Um, she had sent me that horseshoe, the horse, the mule shoe on the left that she had also found. Um, she thought I might uh, put it in to the piece also, but it was very, very big and heavy it didn't kind of work but i brought it back with me and i put it in there and worked around that and kind of just kind of intuitively laid that other stuff down with her while she was putting up that old coal grate with the beautiful color in there and we just kind of worked together for a couple of hours and talked and it was really wonderful um, for a couple of days in a row while i was there so it was really super nice. And I went around and took tons and tons of photographs. So this is me just being ecstatic at being there. And last but not least, this, I leave you with my, what I will say to you all, find your own path and leave a trail is my piece that I did in Sardinia for the symposium. And I think I have found my path. I hope I'm leaving a trail and I am very happy to answer any and all questions you have. And if you don't already follow me, this is where you can find me. Thank you so much. So um, a few questions have come in while you were speaking. Maybe we can let start me, with those. Let me see if I can get back here. Stop content and play around. All right. So now you can see all of us. Um. Okay, are you ready to take some questions? I am. Okay, so back when you were talking about 
your your pre mosaic days. Um, Susan Altman is wondering why you decided not to play music and switch totally to mosaics. <laughs> it was time. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. I think part of it was part of the whole situation of the time. I was evacuated from Katrina. I had been playing with the band for five years that I that it was time to leave that particular band. I didn't actually quit playing music altogether. I actually did play music for a while. I still do play music. I mean, I just don't play professionally anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Carol has a question in the heads up mosaic. What is the beard made of? Is that slate? It's slate, yes. Good guess, Carol. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, Beth is wondering, is each piece of the horse then set it on the mesh and then you sent it to the ruins? Did you put those on mesh? Yes, the whole thing is on, the whole thing is on mesh, yes. Okay. All right, we're getting some thank yous um, and how much people love your last piece and its message. Um, all right, so we have a question here. Susan's wondering, she said she'd like to know more about how you decide on the tones of a portrait. They, they, she says they seem counterintuitive and yet they work. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, It's all relative. First of all, it's all relative. So the first thing is figuring out the 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 value in rel in the relative values. So you have to figure out what's the light, what's the medium, and what's the dark. Okay. And then there's something about the mood, you know. And so is it is it um is it dark? Is it light? I mean, is it, is it, um, uh, my, my, my words aren't coming out. Is it, uh, warm and cool, warm and cold. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Stuck there. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's something like that. Do you want it to be, uh, like, a, you know, bright colors or, you know, warm colors, cool colors, you know, and then within that, then again, light, medium, dark you know, so mm -hmm. is that helpful? Does that, does that, yeah. I see Susan nodding, so that's great, thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, so Sandra says brava and thank you and is wondering who you studied with in Spilimbergo. Oh, my teacher was, um, um, I wouldn't be able to answer that question years later. <laughs> so I don't remember her name right. My name, her name's out of my head right now. I'm sorry. I, I can't remember her name. That's quite all right. Um, it was a four day course. Yeah. Um, maybe if you, uh, I, that was, that was Sandra. She was, can uh, follow up with you. if she, Yeah. I have it written down. Know. I mean, I do, I do know her name. I just, is, I'm blanking right now. I have a really bad memory, but y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. All right. And we have another question from Alyssa. So she's asking, um, if you're not a natural at drawing, how do you suggest it's best to start this process? Maybe starting with a photograph or how else? Uh, which process? Alyssa, do you want to unmute and, and speak? Um, sorry, I missed the first couple of minutes of your presentation. So you might have already... The beginning where you're using an image for your inspiration or for your your basis for the mosaic. Oh yeah. Oh, so if you haven't done a lot of drawing, mm -hmm. well, I suggest you start drawing. Yeah. But I, <laughs> which I mean, I suggest that to everyone, and and I and I I mean, and I'm serious about it in the in a way that, um. 
nobody's, an, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a natural and I still don't consider myself a drawer at all. Right. But I practiced a lot. I mean, I did it. I, once I started with this, the, with the portrait part, I started doing it every day, like every day for years and, um, real. And even if it was just a few minutes, like what I say now to people is, is just carry a notebook around with you, a sketchbook around with you and just you know why we always find ourselves sitting around somewhere waiting for this appointment or that appointment or just whatever just sit around for a few minutes every day and just draw something just sit down and look at something and draw something just for a few minutes I mean just for starters but I mean just just just, just as a practice just do it just do it. for <laughs> your immediate thing but for your immediate question you know in reality if you haven't mm -hmm. done it but is a good practice what to do and what I like to will do in my class with students. Like we start out with a little exercise before we start where we just draw our piece. We just take our reference photo that we're going to do and draw it. Okay. We just take it. You're, even if you're not going to use it as you're, you're not going to do anything from it, but it's an exercise for yourself to understand what you're looking at. Right. Gotcha. It makes you look at it better. It makes mm -hmm. you really look right at what you're seeing rather than think you're looking at it. Like you're going to put something where you think it's supposed to be, you know? So once you, you know, and you don't have to show it to anyone, you can just have your reference notebook, you know, I'm going to do this piece. And before I do it, let me just do a couple sketches you know, and right. then you might end up start liking your sketches. It's wonky and funky, but I like it. You know, yeah. it's your own thing. You know, it becomes your own thing. That's what I like about my drawings. It's like, they don't, they're not that. They're not the original thing. I don't want it to be the original thing. I want it to be my own thing. I want it to be my own funky, weird shit. You know, it's <laughs> fine. It's not that what it was it's my own thing right right and that's yeah. what you want it to be you want it to be your own and that's why when you start drawing it it becomes your own you don't right. want to trace it at someone else's thing you want to start drawing it and you want to draw it 10 times 20 times mm -hmm. and then it becomes your own I have a question yeah. on that here helps. that um that's related in some ways. So the question here is, um, how do you approach the transition then from drawing or painting to the mosaic? Once you have the image. Oh, how, like, like putting it on your substrate? What mm. do you mean? Well, let's see. So that was Nancy. Nancy, do you want to ask your question out loud? I just meant, is there a method or some formula that you follow when you go from your finished painting or drawing that you're going to transfer to be the mosaic? What do you consider first? Or do you always start at a certain point or something methodical? Oh, you mean like starting with the eyes or something like that? Is that what you mean? Maybe, yeah, it could be that. Well, I, who, I wish I could Well, what's see. your most important consideration when you're doing the final mosaic? I don't, um, that's, I don't know. I, I don't know that I know how to answer that question. Um, my final, cons my, I don't know. I don't know that answer to that. Question. I have a version <laughs> of that question. And I, then, yeah, and then I'm not sure. yeah, so, yeah. so do you have a step one when you're sitting with your drawing um, or your painting? Do you, for example, take out lots of pieces that you might consider mm -hmm. using? Do you um, 
so like look at your lights and darks in your drawing and then lay out what would be what do you have a first step oh like okay well yeah there are there's a variety of things like sometimes yeah sometimes i will have sometimes i'll choose a drawing because there's certain things that make me want to do it and i have certain things in mind like I know I want to use a certain thing to do this, or I have certain materials in mind that I know that are going to work well with this, or certain combinations of things that I know already that are going to work well with this, or I just like an expression or something. And so then I go find what's going to make that work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that can go either way like that. Um, so yeah, so if I don't already know what I want, you know, what materials, then yes, then I will go searching and I'll go, you know, I'll search what, what will make this get, have the, um, have, you know, get across the idea that I want it to get across with, you know, what material will do this for me, you know, mm -hmm. what, um, yeah. And Thanks. I often, yeah, and I often do start with the eyes or like if I'm, especially with Picassiette, I'll, a lot of times it'll be about the shape of something. Um, and I can start there, like it'll be about, you know, what kind of shape something is. And I may have a piece of something that gives me that shape and is the reason for something, or, you know, there's an element of a piece a particular piece of pottery or an image on something that sparks an idea. I mean, there's just so many possibilities, <laughs> you know, and the thing is that I don't have a singular method. I'm always experimenting and I'm always kind of changing what I'm doing and adding and adding to my repertoire of choices and cluttering my studio. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, all right, so we have a few more minutes left and um, there, there are a few people on the chat um, hoping that you will come back to New England to teach. It sounds like you had some things planned and then canceled them. I, I, so the question is, do you have any plans to be in our area? Oh, I, yes, I want to. So um, maybe this summer. That sounds good, right? That would be great. I see a lot of nodding heads too. Um, so, so then we have a practical question which is whether the portrait party is on Instagram. No, it is not. The, the portrait party still exists and is still going, but it's, its home base is still on Flickr. <laughs> and yes, and the unfortunate thing is that, um, is that when Flickr was taken over by Yahoo, about four years ago, Yahoo just screwed everything up, really. I mean, it was so good. It was such a wonderful, vibrant group. And then when Yahoo bought it, things kind of got, a lot of people left, things got messed up. But we're still there. It's still happening. People can still join. You can still join if you want. You have to apply, you know, just, just, you don't have to apply. You have to have a Flickr account. You have to have a few, few things in there and you have to send it. You have to, you have to, I mean, apply. You have to, you know, write Julia a little thing and say you want to do it and then, you, you know, but it's not like a big thing. If you want to do it, you can do it. So mm -hmm. um, if you want to do that, you can uh, go to Flickr. You can write to me, send me a note and tell me and I can send you the link to, to that if you're interested. Um, Great. Thanks. I can connect you into that. Um, okay. um, yeah. And Suzanne is sharing that you were actually scheduled to come over, come to Moe's Mosaic Oasis in um, May yes. of 2020, but that had to be canceled. So yes, it was my last scheduled. 
Yes, it was my last thing canceled. And I just got a notice from my, I have a, a credit for that cancellation. I just got a notice. I need to re uh, schedule something not to lose that credit. So I mm -hmm. need to do that. Yes, Suzanne. Oh, have to let us I, all know. I, yeah. Um, and so <laughs> Carol's wondering what, um, what kind of substrate do you use? I know you mentioned wood once or twice. Is that always your substrate? Oh, no, I barely ever use wood anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I use wood, those were paintings I did on wood old, long ago, and I then I just decided to do the mosaics on top of them because I had done mm -hmm. them. I rarely use wood, and those were really little. Um, I most always use some kind of, uh, I, I'm, I either make my own substrate out of, uh, mesh and uh, out of fire, you know, foam and fiberglass, or I use like a hydroban or a wee board. Now I'm using hydroban more, which is a, you know, it's like a white, white, lightweight, uh, like weedy board, but it doesn't mm. have the fiberglass bumps mm. on it, which is nice. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we are really close to nine o'clock. Um, I would like to say thank you, thank you on behalf of the group, but I'm also gonna hand it back to Amy to do a close out. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to let you know about some upcoming events. On March 2nd, we're going to have um, a work along session um, for those people who have signed up to be part of the Mosaic for Afghan Women. Um, and um, Madeline Turgeon, who is um, from Quebec, will be speaking about the project, um, showing us a, pro a work in progress and what techniques she it uses to um, create her Afghan um, uh, textile mosaics. Um, on March 10th, um, Kathleen Newsham is going to be doing um, a New York City subway mosaic virtual tour with us. Um, we On March 14th, um, we're do two of the of the four mosaic artists who are going to be speaking um, are members of NEMS and um, basically, it, it's about their collaboration for mosaic artists collaborating um, to create a Boston Tree of Life mosaic um, for a healthcare institution in Boston. Um, and April 21st, Make It Mosaics Q&A with um, Bonnie Fitzgerald and um, Kim Wozniak. So, um, come up with some questions that you've always wanted answers to, and those two will address the questions. Um, again, thank you, Gila, and um, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, um, and then, um, Amy, I just want to sneak in one more reminder that Terry sent along, which is that um, if any of the NEMS members on the call have not paid their dues for this year, please do. That helps us with all kinds of the small expenses that we have as an organization. And for anyone else who's joining us for this webinar, I'd encourage you to look at what membership means because it's extremely reasonably priced and you get all kinds of wonderful opportunities and benefits. So um, you don't have to live in New England to join. We'd love to have you. Thanks, Amy, sorry. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us and- Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>